Hello, friends. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Elliot Parker, and whether you're a writer, a reader, or just a lover of words, I invite you to stop what you're doing and join me for a page break. And joining us today for a page break is the author of the terrific new book, whose novels have been described as rhapsodic and haunting, and he's out with his latest book. That is James Wade's Beasts of the Earth, which came out in fall of 2022, and I'm so delighted to have him join us today for a page break. But before we get to that, a reminder to subscribe to the channel if you're visiting us for the first time, or if you've popped in and watched some of our other programs and haven't subscribed yet, go down to that little red box there at the bottom and click subscribe. You can follow me and everything going on through my social media channels over there uh, on the right. So give those a like. If you're following us and listening to this interview on Instagram, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to like this interview, leave us some comments in the comments fields, and then hop over to the YouTube channel, look for page break, and you can join us and not miss out on anything that we're doing here on the program because we've had a great 2022, a lot of great interviews and stories coming your way on the channel in 2020. But that's 2023. We're talking about 2022. James Wade is our guest today. He lives and writes in the Texas Hill Country with his wife and daughter. He's the author of River Sing Out and All Things Left Wild, which was a winner of the MPIBA Reading of the West Award for Debut Fiction, and it was also a recipient of the Spur Award for Best Historical Novel from the Western Writers of America. And again, his latest book is called Beasts of the Earth. So James, welcome to the show. I'm so glad to have you here. It's really an honor to speak with you about your new book. Well, I, I just appreciate it, man. I'm I'm hyped up. I'm pumped up. I love, I love talking about writing. I love talking about uh, books and who better than the professor himself, you know, to, to lead this discussion. And so I'm just, it's an honor and a privilege, man. I'm just along for the ride and couldn't be happier to be here. Well, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And I'm glad to have you here. And, you know, your book, River Sing Out, which um, it came out, I know you you wrote it and it kind of got published during the pandemic and during the shutdown. It was my favorite read by far of 2021. And uh, you're back with this brand new book. And it's just so fascinating and so wonderful. I wanted just to read kind of a general summary for our audience, and then we'll kind of dive into the book uh, just a little bit. And uh, this book, Beasts of the Earth, focuses on uh, a lot of different things. It's got some violence involved. It's got some small town secrets, some issues of lingering trauma as it affects communities and characters. And we follow kind of dual narratives uh, in this particular story. Harlan LeBlanc is a groundskeeper at Carter Hills High School, which is in Texas. It's a town that has really gone through some ups and downs and it is really reeling uh, from an oil downturn and an oil slowdown set in 1987. And Harlan's just kind of an everyday man that has a very simple routine. Teen, but when his co-worker, who is a recent high school graduate named Gene Thomas, is seen cradling the dead body of his ex-girlfriend Cassie Harper, everybody in town assumes that Gene killed her, but LeBlanc suspects otherwise and he starts sleuthing. So that's the one narrative. And then the other parallel narrative that runs through the story is set in 1965, and we follow 12-year-old Michael Fisher, uh, who lives with his mother and his younger sister on a Louisiana bayou. And unfortunately, Michael's father, a child rapist and murderer, he's released from jail and brings terror back to their house, including sexual abuse of the two children. Michael flees eventually from that awful situation and finds protection from an older individual, sort of a loner himself, who shows him the first real love and kindness uh, that he's ever experienced in his life. And so that's kind of a general summary of, of what goes on in your book. And I guess I wanted to ask you first, James, when you wrote this story, did you know that you were going to have these, these parallel stories kind of running concurrently? And if you did, did you write one first and then the other, or did it, was it written like we read it in terms of alternating back and forth between uh, uh, LeBlanc and uh, Michael's stories? Yes, sir. Um, you know, for the two timelines, I knew that I wanted to involve Michael a little bit um, because as we see as readers, you know, these stories intertwine later in the book. And um, and so I wanted a little bit of that Louisiana setting, uh, but it wasn't until I actually started writing Michael and then even more so started writing Remus, who uh, you alluded to as the the man who kind of takes Michael in to, to show him the difference between right and wrong, to show him kind of, you know, what love is and how the world can be good. And, and basically Remus became, I thought, the hope of the novel. And, uh, and once I kind of stumbled on that character, really, I thought, well, 
this this is going to need some more time. And so then the challenge was to make sure that the story arcs mirrored one another. Like I didn't want I didn't want Harlan's crescendo and Michael's crescendo to be very scattered. You know, I wanted it to kind of because they're both it's a very um, it's a very mirrored plot for each of them to where they both have these huge decisions to make um, kind of in their own penultimate chapters in the novel. And I wanted those to happen with the reader ha having it back to back, just kind of like a, a one, two combination, um, you know, and I thought that would be the most effective way to tell the story. And, uh, and so I wrote it more, as uh, you said, I wrote it more the way that we're reading it. Just, um, I don't write chronologically, so everything was kind of scattered, but uh, but I definitely would alternate, you know, the writing days or something like that. I didn't write one and then it, finish it and go back and write the other. But uh, but yeah, it, it, in the end, it was basically going back and a lot of copy and pasting to kind of get everything to to line up. Um, and and so that again, so that that plot line, I mean, you know, you've seen like the poster boards that writers have or screenwriters have that show kind of the arc of everything. And I wanted it to look like if you laid the two stories on top of each other, you know, it would basically just be one line. And so that was that was the most difficult part about the dual timeline and uh, something I'm not necessarily ready to jump into again. But <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. What was it difficult in terms of of, of your thought process jumping from a, a character who's kind of middle-aged in Harlan and then a 12 year old boy in Michael. Cause not only are they in two different time periods, you know, the mid 1960s and the 1987, but you know, a middle-aged man is going to see and kind of respond and react to different things or to things in their life differently than a 12 year old was, was that difficult to kind of mentally shift back and forth uh, in, in putting those stories together? And did you find yourself thinking, Oh, wait a minute, that's something Harlan would say, not my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, first of all, that's a great observation. Um, and it wasn't as hard as it may have been if I hadn't, if this wasn't on the Hills of River Sing out where I had written Jonah uh, Hargrove, who was very similar to Michael Fisher. And so, you know, they're around the same age, they kind of have similar issues. And, uh, and so I was still kind of fresh when it came to writing the younger characters. And I also like writing those younger characters. I think there's just in, in so many just classic works of literature, um, you know, we see it through the younger. you know, I think about like Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird, or, uh, you know, you, you see, it's almost like you can explain things even better from the innocence part of it you know and then once you've lost that innocence it's a little more difficult with the Harlan of the world because uh that's where I that's where I go a lot of I go into a lot of more of an external writing thing so like we don't we don't feel as readers we don't see what Harlan is thinking a lot um you know we have to interpret it based on his actions based on conversations there it's not a lot of stopping and going well, Harlan felt this way about this, you know what I mean? And so, uh, and I like that writing style. As a reader, I like to read that more. I don't need to be spoon fed every emotion that the characters are having. And uh, and so with, with Harlan, it was kind of more of what's happening externally, what's the plot doing. And with Michael, again, with, with a younger character like that, you can, you can touch on the internal in a way that is still a little less spoon fed because it's something you know 12 year olds are not going to be reading beast of the earth and so it's it's kind of something that we come at as a reader um in this artistic way like you know how how is this 12 year old interpreting this very adult theme or this very uh you know dangerous situation or violent incident or any of that stuff and so um so it makes it i don't know it spices it up a little bit um and so again it just i don't ever want readers to feel like i'm just ladling information to them i want them to be engaged and to have to do a little of the work themselves honestly because i think that keeps you engaged right and keeps your eyes from glazing over yeah very well said and one of the traits about your books that, that i always love and it's so true uh, of beasts of the earth is your minor characters your your characters that aren't the sort of the headline characters or maybe not the central protagonist or antagonist always play an important role and for example in michael's life you mentioned remus 
Uh, Remus has a relationship with uh, another character named Deacon, who I'll ask you more about in just a second. Um, uh, Harlan has these relationships with the grounds crew that he works with and the supervisor, who's kind of a, a loudmouth jerk. And then he has sort of a, a, the, the teacher, one of the teachers at the school. They kind of develop a little romance. And, and what I love about the way you construct stories is we have to pay attention to those characters. You don't bring a character in to the main character's lives just for window dressing, that th there is a purpose there. And I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about that, about, about the role of sort of minor characters and their interactions with, with, with your main characters in this story, because I think your minor characters play such an important role in ultimately what happens to Harlan and Michael. Can you talk a little bit about, about them and, and just your general thoughts about minor characters and the roles they play in fiction? Yeah. I mean, you know, the easiest, I think the easiest uh, analogy is we see it all the time in film where going into the Academy Awards or something, you know, everybody is focused on the best supporting actor thing. We talk about how much somebody will be like, they stole that movie, right? They're in two scenes. They, they were on the, they were in the film for 15 minutes, but like everybody's talking about their performance. And, um, and a lot of times that's when you really see actors and character actors shine and that's so i always kind of have that in mind with uh with secondary characters is like they don't have as much time on the page so we can allow them to be have a little bit bigger personalities we can allow them to um be kind of more of like guideposts for our main characters not that you can't write a novel um with with just a huge loud uh main character but i think that for me as a writer that gets a little tiring if like if your main character is just boisterous and over the top well after eighty thousand words that's it's just kind of it loses its luster but uh but if you have a somewhat grounded um almost reserved main character then it's a lot easier for the reader to see this world through their eyes um, and then you, you have all of these side characters, characters that make the world feel more real. Um, and so for me, just about everything I write, including Beast of the Earth, is it's set in the South. It's usually set in Texas. And these are the folks I grew up with. These are the characters that, you know, they're not, they're not based on specific people, but certainly based on a, a specific culture and an attitude and a reverence for uh, for storytelling and and for being kind of larger than life characters and and I think that that's what we do is we see these characters specifically in the Texas uh, storyline we see them through Harlan and it's almost like he's so out of place because everybody is so loud and so out there and he's so reserved um, and it and it just it shows kind of the the life that he's made for himself and why he sticks so meticulously to this routine. Um, because it's almost like everybody's moving a hundred miles per hour and he's just kind of very slowly slipping through, uh, unnoticed, you know? And then for Michael, it's kind of the same thing. Remus and Deacon are, are characters that he's, he would have never come across. You know what I mean? Um, he, he didn't have these people in his life. Uh, and then when they, when he was ended up with them, it was like, I don't know. I just, I feel like we all have those people again, you know, just drawing from my own experience. You have these people that they're not, they may not be family or anything like that, but they mentor you in this really unexpected way and kind of show you the way that things could be or, or should be. And, and yeah, I don't know. I just, I have such a reverence for keeping those characters, like you said, to not have them just be there, right. To have them every conversation is a lesson or every conversation is a hint at the plot or the theme or you know it just I don't want to waste uh the words but at the same time you know I want to I want to make everything entertaining you know from from Harlan's neighbor being you know kind of a kind of a crass guy but also providing a little comic relief um you know the heckler twins who are these you know oil millionaires but still wear overalls and drink coffee at the diner every day like it just again it's to me yes it's it's great to have good character development but also it it kind of fills out the world it makes that world feel more true and um and something about the character most of these side characters again especially in the texas storyline is they all kind of provide this comedy um you know that we're dealing this is a heavy book it's a dark book we're dealing with some really you know intense subject matter 
And yet these characters still find ways to pick at each other and to, you know, tell jokes and all that. And um, to me, that makes it feel not only does it give the reader a bit of a, you know, place to come up for air, but also it makes it feel more true um, because that is one of the coolest qualities of, of humans is like the world's on fire around us. And yes, we want to put it out, but also, you know, we'll find a way to kind of giggle about it a little bit too, just so we don't go insane, you know? And, um, and that's, that's kind of the, the vibe or the attitude that I had with, with beasts of the earth is the book can really swallow you whole if you don't come up for air and take it with a, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of levity. Yeah, very well said. And I'm so glad you mentioned the 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 analogy of the best supporting actor and stealing the movie. When you said that, I was thinking about the movie Shakespeare in Love, which came out a number of years ago. Judy Dench plays Queen Elizabeth, and uh, she has literally five minutes at the end of the film. Right. She kind of parades in, and she won a best supporting actress Oscar for that five minutes of being in the film. But she was, I mean, when she walked in, I mean, your eyes and your eyes were focused right on the screen and your mouth just dropped. She looked and sounded. And that's, moved, yeah, that's like the, Elizabeth. That's the perfect example is, you know, you, you have these and you, and it's like, you know, it too, you know, it as a reader or, you know, it as a, as a viewer, when you're watching the movie or when you're reading the book, um, because, you, you want more, but you know that if there was more, it wouldn't be as impactful. You know what I mean? It just, uh, I, I don't know. There's some, there's some magic that you can kind of uh, grasp with like just the right amount of pages or just the right amount of scenes or, or lines or whatever. And, uh, and so that's what that, for me, that was Remus uh, and, and Remus and Deacon and their kind of relationship. I, it's weird because it, it has the least to do with the overall plot. Um, but at the same time, it really is kind of the heartbeat of, of the novel because it, it, it impacts Michael so much. And then as we see later on in the novel, um, you know, he he's still so torn. Right. Because as much as they showed him kind of almost this better way, um, he can't you know, he can't fully write off his his traumatic experiences and, and his past. And so um, and I think that's the whole that's the whole battle of the novel. Right. Is can we. We all want to be good people. We all want to be compassionate and kind. We want to be moral. Um, and that's all fine and well. And even though it's easier said than done, um, what makes it infinitely harder is when you take all those themes and you just drag them through the mud and you just kick the heck out of them. And, you know, and, and really when life pins you in a corner, you know, can you can you hold on to those ideals? Um, and there's a lot of discussion um, in the real world about, nature versus nurture. And, you know, we have this word humanity and humanity is, it's usually, that's a positive thing. Um, but at the same time, I don't know, this book kind of asks that question of when Michael and when Harlan are in these tough positions, it's not so much, can they ward off the, the evil things that have happened to them? It's, can they ward off their own human nature? Um, because they've been nurtured by people who were nurtured by people who were nurtured by people who all had this like very awful nature. And at some point you have to kind of stop and go, well, like which one is real? You know, I always tell people when my daughter um, was really small, if you were, if you put something in front of her face that she didn't like, she hit it, you know, she knocked it out of the way. And so you have to, you know, it's, it's in that, that violence is kind of inherent and you have to teach, you have to teach peace. Right. Um, and so, and I know there's a lot of different philosophies on that and I'm certainly not trying to preach to anybody cause I don't have the answer, but certainly this book kind of at least asks the question and puts some questions out there, um, about what, what the baseline for human nature really is. Um, you know, and then we talk a lot in the book about nature itself and the, the, the beauty and the, and the danger and the violence. And it's all, it's, it's all a lot more gray, I think, than, uh, than we give it credit for. And, and so the book kind of, that's where this book is. It kind of exists in that gray area, you know, nothing's really black or white. And, uh, and I like that because I think that w what we don't have a ton of in today's world is, is nuance. You know what I mean? Everything seems to be extreme one way or extreme the other. And, um, and I'm always trying to look for kind of the, that middle ground where, where both parties are wrong, both parties are right, you know, uh, if we're both pissed off, it's probably good compromise. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's where we try to go with Beasts of the Earth and how we try to uh, attack the characters and, and get into their minds a little bit. 
Yeah, that, that that's su- such great information. And so well said. And I love what you said about compromise. And I heard somebody describe compromise this way. Uh, both people have to leave the room mad in order Absolutely. to through compromise, you know, because everybody has to can't get everything they want and somebody has to give up or both sides have to give up something that they really wanted. So um, if you're following us on Instagram, welcome to our page break interview with author James Wade. Please feel free to like this video and uh, leave us some comments in the comments field and then hop over to uh, YouTube and like the uh, page break channel. We're talking with James Wade. He's the author of this brand new fantastic novel that you're going to want to make sure you get this on your to be read pile before 2022 comes to a close. It's called Beasts of the Earth. And so, James, we'll come back to the book in just a second, but I want to put you on the hot seat and we're going All to right. give our audience a chance to get to know you a little bit better uh, with some semi serious, but also some not so serious questions. And um, you're feel free to you can answer these in one word or if you want to elaborate on them, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to do that. It, it's totally up to you. So my first hot seat question for you is. If you weren't a writer, what would you be doing? Lord, have mercy. Uh, I was in, I, well, I was going to say journalism, but that's kind of writing. I, I started my career in journalism and then messed around in politics for a little bit before I got too fed up with it. Um, you know, I, I think the dream job, and I don't think anybody would let me uh, do this, but I think the dream job would just be probably like a like a fitness instructor or something, you know, something just real you don't have to think a ton, just get your endorphins going every day, um, you know, and, and something that takes me out of what writing takes me out of the real world to a degree, you know, and it helps me work on uh, my, my own stuff. And so I think maybe maybe just working out or something. I don't know. That's I, I think I would be terrible at anything but writing. That's why I have to make this work. If you're watching this, go buy the book, because if not, I'm just like there's no there is no backup plan for me. <laughs> That's right. So we have to keep James going. We have to keep it together and keep everything together for him and his family. Fair enough. Well said. Let, let me ask you this in light of that. What is your least favorite aspect of writing? Oh, goodness. Uh, the business side, for sure. A hundred percent. You know, as much as I love doing this stuff, I love doing this just for the fellowship, the camaraderie. Um, I get real fired up talking about books and talking about writing especially the craft of writing i'll nerd out on that all day uh but when it comes to like social media and having to how many followers do you have and you need to do this hashtag and all that stuff and you know that's bad enough but then it starts to creep in a little bit and uh and this is because i want to say somewhere in the late 70s or early 80s most of the publishing houses went from being run by literary people to being run by business people and you can't blame them for that i mean you know it's that's they're the founder of the feast you know what i mean they're they're paying the bills but uh but you know all of a sudden you have business people kind of telling you or or suggesting uh you know what you should write about or how you should change your books or what you should not write about and uh and that gets a little dicey because again you know you i'm 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 an employee you know what i mean my publisher pays me to write these books and and i if they don't sell then i I have no value to them as an employee and so you know i want the books to sell and, and certainly i want the publisher uh, to be happy, but but there's definitely uh, that business side and that business pressure um, to kind of do what's trendy or you know whatever, which I don't do. I mean, I'm I'm the least sexy writer. My goodness, like I try. I, I say this. I try to my themes. I try to make them timeless, like things that would have been true in you know the turn of the 20th century uh, to now. You know the same things that humans have always kind of grappled with. I'm, I'm kind of doing that um but that really takes you out of like the what's hot this year or what you know um what's trending and 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 all that and so I kind of feel bad honestly for like my publicity folks at the publisher because I'm like how the hell do you uh you know you say here's a here's a guy that's just kind of writing you know writing these things that we've that we've talked about a lot you know and and but that's just because I think that they're still so important and um, and so I, yeah, I think it's the business side of things and trying to be trendy or sexy or salacious, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm not any good at that. I'm never going to be. And so uh, again, I almost, it's almost like a, I pity the, uh, the folks that are trying to, you know, push my novel out there with, with all the 
cool hip new stuff <laughs> new stuff because i'm never going to be that you know i'm just i'm going to try to go be the the engine that's slow and steady <laughs> fair enough fair enough so who is one writer you think everybody should be reading right now oh goodness i mean i could say about 30 dead fellas let me uh let's do let's do somebody that's that's alive and in the and in their prime i'd probably say taylor brown um yeah gods of Howl mountain wing walkers uh he's he's absolutely tremendous david joy is is another great one and our friend matt bondurant uh yeah. there at, at old miss he just came out uh with oleander city this year which i think is just gosh he's true he's a he's a tremendous writer um yeah and all those guys that i named they all just piss me off you know i read them and i just like ah oh, why didn't i think of that or, or how did they just put that sentence together but uh but yeah, and of course, I just finished The Passenger, right? And it's not like Cormac McCarthy needs any plugs from me, but uh, <laughs> but uh, to anybody that thinks he fell off because he's waited 16 years or because he's, uh, you know, almost 90 years old. Yeah, no, he didn't. He's still he's still the best we've got. And uh, and I was totally blown away by The Passenger and, and couldn't believe the, the stamina that he had to have. And you could say, well, it took him 16 years. And well, yeah, read the novel. It it. it you know, it's that's the appropriate amount of time to to try to unravel the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> fair, fair enough. So, just a couple more questions, and we'll get you off the hot seat. Fill in the blank for me. I'm afraid of blank. Oh, dying, hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. Excellent. My favorite, your favorite Thanksgiving dinner dish. Oh man, uh, sweet potato casserole probably. That's a t that's a tough one. I'm a I'm a big fan of food. I mean, me and food have a hell of a relationship, and there's not, I, I as long as uh as long as it I think mushrooms is about that's about the only food that I won't eat. Um, and anything else, man, you put it in front of me, it's gone. Well, actually, the correct answer to your question is macaroni and cheese, but we will we macaroni will and potatoes. cheese. Yes, we will accept sweet potatoes. Well, I <laughs> what kind of southerner are you, macaroni oh, and cheese? Yes, it goes with everything. It goes with turkey, hamburger, <laughs> meatloaf, pot roast. You can always have macaroni and cheese. But <laughs> All right. we'll, we'll, we'll let you slide with sweet potatoes. We'll we'll accept that <laughs> as, a, as a as an acceptable answer. <laughs> and uh, my next question: Tell me a little bit about that uh, uh, steer skeleton with the horns behind your <laughs> behind your shoulder there a lot of us have been looking at that while we've been listening so tell us what, <laughs> where did that come from where, what is that did, did, did you find that did you buy that where did that come from we uh somebody gave me that and i feel bad that i can't remember who uh some somebody gave me that uh right after all things left wild came out and they thought it just kind of went with the whole aesthetic and uh and i've in my office i have which this is this is ridiculous and I don't know how many other writers have similar stories, but my office is so meticulously curated to be inspirational and to kind of set the mood. You know, I've got, this is where I keep my, my cowboy boots. It's where I keep all, I have several bookshelves throughout the house, but this is where I keep like the MVP books. You know, if I like, I can just reach back and grab one. I know it's going to be good. I've got my record player in here. I've got an old horseshoe that's for good luck. All these things that are supposed to be, you know, going good, got a leather scented candle lit and nine times out of 10, I end up in my camper writing just because, you know, my daughter's running through the house naked screaming that she's a, a demigod of the wind and sea because she just watched Moana or, or something. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I just, this office is basically turned into her playroom. And then uh, if I can swing it to do the, you know, podcasts and, and interviews, although half of those take place in the camper too. Um, just because I feel bad putting that pressure on my wife to keep keep the kiddo entertained for 30 minutes. But uh, but yeah, the, no, the, the cow skull, it's not real. It's it's made out of some kind of really hard, heavy plastic or, or something. I'm not sure what it's made out of, but it's not bone. Um, although we do, we got a creek behind the house and we find all manner of, uh, of bones back there, but they're usually a lot smaller animals. No, no cow skulls yet. Um, <laughs> the, the, the closest we've got is like, well, you know, we'll see uh it, when the when the bucks drop their antlers you know we might if we're lucky run across a pair of those and um that's definitely a prize but um but yeah i i, I love this office so much i just don't ever get to work in it 
I totally understand. Well, thanks, James, for uh, playing the hot seat game with us and answering those questions. And hopefully that's let uh, the audience get to know a little bit more uh, about you uh, aside from uh, from being a writer. So, so thanks so much for that. And uh, we're talking about uh, James Wade's brand new book. It's called Beasts of the Earth. And I had a couple more questions I wanted to ask you, uh, James, before we finish up. And um, you talked about, you know, a, a few minutes ago before we started the, uh, the the hot questions or the hot seat questions about humanity and about um, kind of what motivates people to to do and behave the, the way that they do. And I, I felt like I wrote this question down because it, it's something that I felt like as I was thinking a lot about your book when I finished it um, that 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 stood out to me. And I'll just ask you if if this theme is is something you hope readers take away from this. Um, and I kept feeling like there were so many things of beauty in your book surrounded by so many things that were evil or dark. And I just felt like that one of the themes of the book is, is can these two things coexist? Can can darkness and goodness or light and darkness or good and evil coexist? Uh, is that something you hope readers will think about when they're reading your story and they're following these characters and we're, we're following Michael and Harlan's stories? Is that something you, you hope they get illuminated on as they're reading your work? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a fair assessment. It's, uh, you know, it's almost like, can they coexist? I mean, they have to, right? You know, um, there's really not, there's not much other choice. Uh, I think that, I think that we are no stranger to seeing the evil in the world. And I think we're no stranger to seeing the good. I, I think, uh, you know, as far as what there's more of, I don't know. It depends on what statistics you're looking at. It depends on where you put your priority in, in terms of how we progress. I mean, it's weird. We live in tumultuous times and yet so has every other generation. Um, and in a lot of ways, we're we're safer now than we've ever been. We've more we're more progressive than we've ever been. Um, and then in other ways, you know, we've we've lost ourselves in, in a certain sense as well. And so I and again, I think you can say that for every generation. I think that that human existence is is even though we've progressed technologically, we are also very cyclical, um, you know, in, in the things that we end up combating, even though we just combat them in different ways. But to me, the ultimate thing is it's not about if good wins out over bad, um, which and again, this book is, operates in the gray area. You know, there's not you can definitely pick out some really bad things in the book. Um but there's also a lot of questions about what even is morality? Um, you know, what what is the right decision? What is justice? Things like that. And so no matter where you fall on that, um, it's not about winning. Um, and I think Harlan is a great example of this. It's not about can we, you know, change and, and be better people if we had something bad happen to us or if we feel like maybe we're not a moral person can we become thus i mean yeah sure a lot of people do that but i think for most of us it's it's just an ongoing battle and that's what life is and and so the important thing is not whether light triumphs dark it's does light keep fighting is light there to keep fighting does light keep showing up and going to work every day type of thing you know and um and so yeah i mean i don't again i don't ever want to feel like I'm preaching because I don't have any answers. And that's, that's what my whole, that's the whole theme of, of all of my work is it's more about asking questions and, and shedding light on certain things that, you know, may be uncomfortable for folks. And I, and I get that, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's me. It's, it's my own therapy, self therapy sessions um, where I'm bringing all kinds of ph philosophical uh, just uncertainty into it, you know, and, and a lot of times the characters go places that I didn't plan for them to go just because I'm, I'm just letting them take the lead, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, with Beast of the Earth, I think this is the first time uh, that I really dove into kind of that notion of everything that's come before. And then also what happens to you moving forward. Cause like with all things left wild, and River Sing Out, we follow our characters to the end of the plot, but not to the end of their journey. You know, um, those books could have sequels where we where we follow the, uh, 
you know, the, the mental and emotional implications of what our characters have gone through. And with this one, we actually do. We actually get to see kind of the outcome of, of Harlan's story and whether or not he's able to, to find peace in the end, you know, and, and this was the first time I ever attempted that. So it was a little scary, but uh, I think it came off pretty well, you know, and, uh, and yeah, and I'm, I'm no expert on humanity. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely an armchair uh, philosopher. And so uh, I wouldn't want anybody to, to look in this book for answers, but if you want to, if you want to have some questions rattling around your head for a little bit and ruin your day, then sure, pick up a copy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I wanted to ask you uh, about Remus and Deacon. We talked about them and, and you alluded to them earlier. Um, there were so many uh, passages that were just so beautifully written in your book and just had me you know, stopping dead in my reading tracks. Um, but this one really brought tears to my eyes and it's from page 265. And I just wanted to read this and and ask you a question to have you comment on it. This is a, a conversation that Remus and Deacon are having. Uh, and to kind of set this up a little bit, Deacon has been away for a while. Uh, Remus is not doing so well. I don't want to give too much away. And Michael has brought Deacon back to see Remus. And, and this is the conversation, or this is what Deacon says to Remus. And you write, there were tears in Remus's eyes and he did not answer. And this is Deacon speaking. He says, that's right. It was you, you sour son of a bitch. You were my grace. You were my proof that there is good, that the hard times are worth it. And whether you believe it or not, that don't change my responsibility. Because see, now I've known grace. I've touched it, loved it. So I'm charged with passing it on. And if I can be the one to give it, then I have to. I have to every time. And it's all your goddamn fault. And I love you. I, I just, I mean, I, I was just dropped, stopped cold when I was reading that because I thought... Uh, in so many ways, that encapsulates their relationship. In so many ways, that encapsulates all the relationships that all the characters have uh, with one another, good and bad. Um, but I think it really also illustrates the kind of special relationship that that Remus and Deacon had. Can you talk a little bit about about their relationship? And I felt like in, in many ways they had the the strongest relationship uh, uh, in terms of love and devotion and dedication to each other uh, than any of the other characters in the story. Yeah, it was, you know, it started as, as an example for Michael, um, because he had never seen an example of what real love is, uh, you know, in, in his household. And so kind of like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we our our mentors, our examples of, of how to do things the right way could come from all kinds of unexpected places. And uh, and so it started as just a way to show Michael, uh, you know, what how you could be a good man, how you could, you know, uh, be a kind man, a moral man. But then it kind of evolved. Like I talked about, I started growing closer and closer uh, to these two, two men. And it was just, I think that and I'm so good. Thank you, by the way, for, for acknowledging that, for reading that, uh, that little section, because I love it so much because again, that's the theme of the entire novel. That's the crux of the novel. That's the crux of the question, right? Um, if we have seen grace, if we've been given grace or, or given an opportunity, you know, it becomes or it should become, I think, if we're if we're trying to do what's right, it should become our responsibility to to pass that on. Right. Because if we don't, if we let that die with us, if we take advantage of opportunities that were given to us, but then we don't give other folks the same opportunities, um, you know, that for every, for every little for every little spindle of the spider web that we chop off, you know, it, we become weaker and weaker as a, as a society. And, um, you know, you and I were talking earlier about being a good literary citizen. You know, I think that's the, I think the same argument uh, applies, you know, Deacon was, he was almost, of course he loved, loved Remus so much, despite the fact that he didn't love himself. Um, but Remus showed him that grace, you know, that, that he, you know, you're not a bad person. You can't be, or else how could I love you? Um, and, and so he helped pick Deacon up through some things that Deacon was really struggling with. And, and Deacon's not a perfect character. You know, he's, he struggles with alcohol. He struggles with his, his, his own sexual identity in terms of he's a very religious man. And so that, you know, that those things clash um, in that setting in the 1960s. And, and he doesn't, there's just a lot that is really weighing on his heart, but, 
Remus was able to cut through all of that um, and and show him that grace. And, and Deacon was almost upset about it in a sense, because he's like, damn it, now I have to, you know, now that I've been touched with this love and blessed with this love, now I have to go out and show this to other people, you know, and it's like, He's it's this begrudging, uh, almost obligation that he has, you know, like, ah, now, I, you know, you took this kid in. And even though I think, you know, that's crazy. Now I've got to make sure that this kid's OK and, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, and I've seen that a lot in my own life. Uh, you know, when we see people doing the right thing, it, it touches us. Right. It impacts us. Um, it's why we respond so emotionally to, to what you would call like a feel good story. Right. Um, the, let's, we think about make a wish things or any, it, basically any package they run on college football game day, uh, you know, they'll run some package about they've lost a family member to a rare disease, but the community rallied around them. And like, we just have, I mentioned earlier, we, we, it's easy to find the examples of, of people inflicting pain. But it's equally as easy to find the examples of people that are promoting love and, and, and spreading kindness and as corny as that sounds. But uh, but yeah, that's, you know, even even in the heart of this really dark novel and, and terrible circumstances and situations, the fact that Remus and Deacon can maintain this love and and pass it on to michael um it's because then it becomes his responsibility right and is he going to be able to take this example he's been shown and have it overcome kind of the nature that he's grown up you know the, the poor examples and kind of the nature that's been instilled into him and so so yeah i mean just literally that little passage you read is is basically the the setup for the the plot of the novel you know and, and the plot of the question that that the novel asks which is can we can we take a good example and carry it or do we tend to fall back into to negative ways so last question for you james as we finish up where can folks get copies of beasts of the earth Anywhere books are sold, you can get it. I will say I would love for you to go to your local independent bookstore. Um, you know, these folks, there, there are very few indie bookstores in our country that are just absolutely, you know, making a ton of money. Right. These are these are local businesses. These are small business owners. And if you buy a book from them, you're keeping your dollars in your local economy and you're you're helping somebody out. Um, and usually it's somebody that opened the bookstore not to make a bunch of money but just to to provide for the community to uh to have a place where folks can go and gather and, and and promote the written word and so that's what i'd love for you to do uh if you have to do it online bookshop.org is a great place that gives back to those independent bookstores and of course if you want to do amazon i'm not gonna judge you baby just just hold your nose and do it and uh and i'm just happy you're reading you know what i mean if if, if everybody uh if everybody's reading, then I'm happy and I won't complain about how the books got there. James Wade has been our guest here today. He is the author of River Sing Out and All Things Left Wild, but more importantly, the author of this brand new terrific book. And folks, I'm telling you, you've got to read this. You will not be disappointed. You will be uh, enlightened. You will love it. You will be uh, sad and moved and excited and engrossed in a, a wonderful story uh, told by uh, just a terrific writer. And uh, I'm so excited to get a chance to talk with him today to talk about this uh, Beasts of the Earth, his brand new book, uh, and to get his perspective on, on how and why things came together. James, thanks so much for taking a page break with us today. Absolutely. Hey, thank you for having me. You're way too kind. Your check's in the mail. Uh, and for those who might be suspect after hearing me ramble on a little bit, I'm a much better writer than I am a talker. So I hope you all grab the book and enjoy it. Thanks so much.